Hello and welcome to another episode of iHomeschool Hangouts. I'm Jimmy Lanley, co-owner of iHomeschool Network, a social media company connecting uh, businesses to the homeschool audience through the power of social media. We are so happy to have you with us, whether you're watching live on the Google Plus event page or live via the YouTube video, or maybe you're watching later via the recorded video or even uh, Stitcher or iTunes podcast. As you know, our hangouts are at a new evening time, still on Thursdays, but at 6 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Central, and 9 p.m. Eastern. So hopefully you've got the kids to bed or at least fed and happy and you can come and join us live. Of course, if you can't make it live, we still encourage you to leave comments and questions on any event page before the event and even afterwards. Sometimes we keep the dialogue going for days after. And if you miss an event live, there's no reason to miss the great content because everything is recorded. You can watch it on YouTube or you can listen on Stitcher or iTunes podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our iHomeschool Network newsletter at iHomeschoolNetwork.com slash newsletter and you'll receive notifications of what our upcoming Hangout topics will be. Those of you watching live, once again, we welcome you. Please feel free to leave any comments or questions on the event page and my wonderful production manager, Marlene Griffith, will be bringing those on screen. Marlene, would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Hey everyone, excited to be joining in again tonight. Um, my name is Marlene Griffith, as Jimmy said. You can find me blogging over at adiligentheart.com um, and I'll be bringing in your comments from the event room. So if you have any questions um, for Janine or her husband, um, just drop them there in the event room and I'll bring it in for them and they'll tackle it. Thank you, Marlene. You are my right-hand woman tonight. I appreciate you. We're going to be shifting our focus to our special guests. They are a married couple, Britton and Janine LaTulip. They live in Idaho. Is that correct, people, Idaho? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, all the way in Idaho. And I realized tonight that Idaho has two time zones, so I'm curious which time zone you guys are in. We are in the uh, Mountain Central time. Mountain, Mountain Standard Central. time. Oh, mountain okay. Yeah. <laughs> mountain time. All right, good. Yep. So tonight we're mountain and central time people, you you guys and me and Marlene. So we are just so happy that you guys are with us. So welcome. And uh, for the audience, uh, Britain has written a book called More Blood. Now, it sounds kind of gruesome, but I'm going to let him explain briefly why he chose this name for his book. And the book is basically about the myths of public education. Um, Britton is the father of four. He is a follower of Christ and he's the owner of Blue Manor Education, which you can find at bluemanoreducation.com. So go ahead and open another tab and, and be looking at that Blue Manor Education. You want to uh, follow that site and blog. And in the store there, you will find many of Britton's resources. He has published nearly 60 children's learning books and a how to teaching, how to teach manual. And More Blood is his greatest work. I have read this book. It's very lengthy. It's very detailed. And it chronicles the secret, secret motives and mechanisms of public education. His wife, Janine, has taught dozens of preschool and kindergarten age children. And she now works from home as a homeschool mom to those four precious children. She posts about the family's adventures and Christian views on BlueManorEducation.com. That's where you can find the La Tulips over in Idaho at BlueManorEducation.com. So first of all, I want to tell everyone that you have a chance to win a copy of uh, More Blood and or a $100 Amazon gift certificate. So I want you to make sure you register. There is a link on the event page with a raffle copter uh, widget where you can enter to win. So make sure that you do that, and we'll um, mention that a couple of other times. Britton, will you tell us a little bit about your book and why you call it More Blood? Yes, and actually that title's um, almost gotten me into some trouble. Some people have seen it, and they're thinking it's some sort of horror, uh, horror novel or something like that. Somebody said it was very scary. Um, we chose that. It has significant meaning, and the idea is back in the 15th century, and actually it goes all the way back to the Egyptians, but... Uh, we had the practice of bloodletting and you had parents who would hold their kids down and, and the doctors would bleed them in some cases bleed them to death 
um, and they thought they were doing a good thing to their kid. They thought they were helping their kid um, get well when in fact it was like the worst thing that they could do. And so we use that as kind of symbolism for what schools become. There's a lot of parents out there that they love their kids, they want the best for their kids, and they think that their kid's future is tied to school um, when it's not. When, it, when, when you finish this book, you realize it's, it's not the worst thing, but it's one of the worst things that, that could happen to a kid. Um, and anyway, that's where the title of the book came. And originally, I wasn't writing this book to be a, uh, a book negative on, on public school. or In fact, I was, I was kind of negative on public school before, but I thought, you know, if you went to a, a private school, it was better. If you went to a prep school, that was pretty good. Um, in doing my research, it was just to to show homeschoolers how they could model their homeschool environment after the prep schools because there's such a, a difference between the two. Um, but then the more I researched this book, the more convinced I was that the school has few redeeming qualities once you start digging. Um, and so I had to just completely change the uh, kind of the thesis of this book, and it became a book um, challenging the whole public school model, or the whole school model, I should say. So. so, Britton and Janine, tell me a little bit about your own uh, school experience, because I'm sure that the book is born out of a lot of your own experiences. It is. Do you, do you want to go, Janine, first? Sure, I will. Okay. Um, my school experience is really average. I um, had pretty good grades in school, A, B, A and B student, and I went to Oregon for school from first grade to graduation and actually all three of my schools elementary middle and high school were in one square block so when I was in elementary we would graduate and we would just go to school right across the field um, and we used to joke how we would be going to like the bad school because their playground was half our size or something like that <laughs> but anyways um, I started to really um, I really liked school and I liked my teachers and things like that and I got into high school and I got into some trouble and I started to you know not like school very much so I had good and bad experiences and I think that that is basically what most Americans experience it's just you know average they they went through it and they you know turned out pretty okay and they're just you know um, fine with it and that's the scary part is that most people don't understand what happened in school and what is going on in school. And so that's where More Blood is real, a real eye-opener. All right. And then my experience um, was just about the opposite of, uh, of Janine's. Can you hear me, Jimmy? Okay, sorry, I can't hear anybody else. Um, it was just the opposite of Janine's. I went to 10 different schools in 13 years. Um, I tr went to schools in six different states. I, I spent time at um, seven different public schools, two private schools, and then probably the most um, original was an elite prep school in Virginia. It was actually a boarding school. Um, we were out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Uh, it was all boys, and it was actually a military school on top of that. And so really, yeah, this book is, is written out of those experiences and reflections on that because I've seen school from literally every angle. And because I changed school so often, I didn't just see, um, you know, I wasn't just experiencing school in different locations. But when you move schools, you literally have to recreate yourself every time you move. And so I, when I look back at my experience, um, there, there was, when I first started out, I guess I could say I was a free spirit. You know, as a young kid, I went to school. If I liked a shirt, I wore it. If a kid was nice to me, we were friends. Uh, then I got a little bit older, you know, probably around third or fourth grade, and I started, you know, getting interested in girls and that's probably when I really started to focus on the uh, the social aspect of school, and I realized I wasn't very popular. Um, no girls had crushes on me or thought I was cute, and uh, I thought it was maybe my freckles or I was kind of short. Um, I, I didn't understand this, the social aspect of school at that point. And then I moved again, and uh, this time something crazy happened, and I, uh, I became kind of a class clown. So I'd always been really shy my whole life. Um, suddenly I was a class clown. I became super popular and uh, like the most popular kid in school for that year and um, that kind of led down a dark path too because as I became popular um, I started acting out more to be that class clown fill that role um, I got into a lot of trouble and by the mid midway through sixth grade I was gonna get expelled um, not for like one serious event but like a whole series of events uh, they just couldn't take you know handle me anymore 
And so then I was homeschooled, and then I went on to middle school, a different school, and uh, and it wasn't cool to be a class clown anymore. The girls didn't like that, so I like my popularity just sank, and it was devastating. And so then it was crazy because I'm this tiny little you know white guy, and I decided I want to be a gangster wannabe, and because uh, that was really cool. And I wasn't a gang or anything, but I dressed like it, and talked like it, and acted like it, and uh, that led to some serious issues, and I had to move schools again. And then I went to a new school, and the crazy thing was I showed up that school, and it's a uh, it was like there was like three gangster wannabes in the whole school, and they were total losers. And so I show up the first day in like extra, 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 extra large uh, shirts and stuff, and FUBU, and that just wasn't cool. And uh, everybody there was into being a prep, and you had to wear uh, like Nautica, which I'd never even heard of. I thought it was for adults. And uh, so I decided to change all my stuff out, and I and I got into the prep thing, and one of these skin tight t shirts and polo shirts, and um. And so I became a prep, and then I moved schools again. And long story short, I got into more trouble, and uh, and then I went to an elite prep school. And I'd say that that's where my school experience really changed, and it really opened my eyes. Um, I realized that, well, for the first time in my life, I would say people think you go to military school and they, they straighten you out, and it's a lot of discipline, and it is that. But this prep school was um, it was intense, it was competitive, and for the first time in my life, I was very inspired by school. I wanted to be a better person. And um, I spent two years there, and then I ended up going to a different small Christian school for my senior year and graduating. And then after that, you know, really quick, I, I, I went to a university for a while, um, a, a private university. It wasn't Christian. Um, then I did join the military. I did several, you know, specialty schools in the military, and then I spent two years at Bible college. So, like, I've literally seen school from every angle, and um, I feel like I was born to write more blood. Um, because I do have that experience. Well, let's so. dig into the content of More Blood. Um, we're going to be talking about two main myths for the rest of our time together. And one of the myths is uh, school is a good place to socialize kids. And the second myth is going to be the purpose of school is to educate kids. So let's start with the socialization issue there. And um, so talk to us about that, Britton and Janine. Uh, so obviously, you that's a myth. You don't think school is the best place to socialize kids because you're calling it a myth. So why is that and where does this myth come from? That's what we want to know. Okay. Well, I'm going to say two things. In the way that we think of socializing in school, it is a myth. And then I'm going to contradict myself a little bit later and I'm going to say that it's not a myth. So to start off with, school is a really bad place to socialize kids. Um, if you're the kid, if you're the parents, um, or if you're the teachers. It's a really bad place. And the reason is, is if we're trying to socialize kids, um, we want them to be able to interact with other people in a mature manner and in the real world. So outside of that little microcosm of school. The problem with school, and it's crazy that we're even having this discussion, because there's nothing redeemable about the social environment of school, and yet somehow it's one of the selling points. And I think it's just because schools can no longer say that they're doing a good job academically. But... Um, if, if you look at the social structure of school, the first thing that stands out is age segregation. Nowhere in society are people divided up according to their age. Um, as soon as a five-year-old enters the school system, that's all they're hanging out with is, is five-year-olds, 30 other five-year-olds in a, uh, a small classroom with very little, um, very little supervision. And so what really happens to those kids is, is instead of growing up and maturing as they they hang out with their parents and other adults and other siblings and, um, and even, you know, understand how to interact with their younger siblings. They end up feeding off of the lowest common denominator in their five-year-old class. And so, really, I, I would make the argument that a five-year-old, before he enters kindergarten, has a better social disposition. And the longer he's in school, the worse it gets. And, and so, suddenly, he's, he picks some things up at school and he goes to grandma's house and he's, you know, making like, like fart noises or something in his, uh, in his armpits. And, and, and he doesn't understand why grandma doesn't appreciate that. And it's because he only knows how to interact now with that, with that strata. And then that age segregation continues. So when he moves on to first grade, instead of acting like a first grader, he's been socialized with five-year-olds. They all move up together, and so they all still have that five-year-old mentality. And it continues on. And I would say that some of these seniors in, in high school still have the mentality of a child. They progressed. It's not like toys and fart noises, but it's – Maybe it's drugs and, and sex and some of the other things that we don't like, but they still um, only know how to socialize with that tiny little microcosm. Yeah, um, and if you if you um, you know had the choice to go visit an elementary school or a high school, I think most people would probably choose 
the elementary school. They just have naturally, children have that happy disposition. They're excited about learning. And then you have this transition where um, you go to the middle school or the high school and it's a lot more, a lot, a lot darker. And, um, you know, you can kind of feel the tension. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and, and, I, and I think, you know, when, when kids finally graduate and are introduced into the real world, they are extremely socially awkward. Um, everything that was okay in the school environment with their, with their peers at that exact age group doesn't work in the real world. And they'll show up to their first job interview, and they've got their pants around their ankles, and they're wearing their beats or whatever, and then they don't, they don't understand why they don't get the job. And it takes them a long time to get out of that social mindset that, that is set for them in the school system. And so really, um, that's, just, that's just one aspect, too, of, of school is that age segregation, that extreme age segregation. Um, and, and the funny thing is, because we do homeschool our kids, um, the other day, Audrey was talking about her birthday party, you know, because she's homeschooled, and the first people she wants to invite to her, her, home, her, her birthday party is grandma, and then her aunts and uncles, and then some of her cousins. And it's funny because she, she has a great time. She says that adults are more fun because... Um, they're more exciting, more interesting than, than other kids. So here's a kid who she can go hang out with her grandma all day and have a great time. She can, she can watch her little baby brother and have a great time. And uh, she can pretty much play with anybody, and, and she's six years old. And when kids get into school, they can't even deal with their siblings. If, if um, I think I turned my camera off. Oh, boy. Sorry. Am I there? Uh, you turned I, it I off for buttons. some reason. You were fine. You were okay. fine. You're fine. Sorry. I, this is new to Google Plus stuff. Um, <laughs> So yeah, at any rate, um, kids socialize in the real world. When they grow up, they have a better time socializing in the real world. And, and kids in school, they only know how to socialize like kids in school. And it puts them at a severe disadvantage when they finally get out into the real world. Right, and where else do you find that age segregation? I don't see that anywhere else um, in the real world. So I don't understand why people think it's a good place. It's like It's like learning to drive a car from someone who doesn't really know how to drive a car or maybe they're a really bad driver. Um, so, you know, if you think about it like that. So tell uh, you you hinted at this, Britton, but I'd like to hear you elaborate about where this myth comes from as far as school being the place to socialize. One thing I heard you say was that schools are failing academically and so they use the socialization issue as a justification for their existence. So is that where you think this myth comes from? Or is it? Is there more to it? Well, there's a lot more to it. Um, like I said, it's not actually a myth. There is a social aspect to school. It's just not one that's good for, for kids or, or families. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'll, I'll handle it two ways. When we think of socializing, we think of kids' ability to, like I said, interact in the real world, get along with other people. Um, I don't see homeschoolers as having issues with that. Um, and I would say that in, in school, um, oh, lost my train of thought, sorry. Because I was going to talk about something else about the socializing before I got into myth. But I would say that this, the, the myth of the awkward homeschooler is just that. It's a myth. You have um, homeschooled kids who, who do interact in the real world. Public school kids, I would say the ones that are kind of socially backwards. I think that that myth of the homeschool, the awkward homeschooler is created for two reasons. One, because the homeschooled kid is just like an adult. He's used to interacting in the real world, and when he's faced with his peers, his public school peers, he doesn't know how to respond to that because it is such a different environment. He doesn't necessarily know what's cool. He doesn't know what brands to wear, and he's kind of intimidated. And he, I look at myself as an adult, and if you put me back in school, um, I would feel uh, intimidated in that social environment as well because I, I, I interact like an adult now. Um, it is an intimidating social environment. So I think that's one of them. The second thing is a ton of people that are homeschooled um, are pulled out of the school. I think it's like 25 to 30 percent of, um, of people that are home or kids that are homeschooled uh, were homeschooled because they were bullied. That means that they were kind of socially, I don't want to say socially awkward, but they were kind of socially awkward. Maybe they were shy in school and they got tormented for it. So all those kids are being pulled out put in the homeschool world, and then they're being pointed out as, as somehow so, sort of social defects because of homeschooling, when in reality they were made socially awkward in the public school system, and now homeschoolers are the ones taking the blame for it. So if we do have a disproportionate number, it's because bullying is one of the leading 
reasons parents homeschool. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, okay. I don't know if I explained and, that very well. but Yeah, yeah. And, when you, and when you think about um, the time before school, before there was school, um, and you would think the way people talk about socializing in school, you'd think that before school no one could socialize. Everyone would duck and cover when they saw anybody, you know, but really they got along just fine. So, um, yeah, like Britton said, it's, it is that. It is a myth. But the other hand, there is a social aspect of school that's very, um, that's very present. And one of the things that I think about when I think about the socializing in school is a time when I was in middle school and we had rented this party bus for graduation. Um, think limo slash short bus. <laughs> I don't know whose idea that was, but um, anyways, we got it and we wanted to go to the mall and hang out. And there was about 12 to 15 of us who came into this mall, and the security guard right away came up to us and said, you have to leave. Um, you're not allowed to be here because the group is considered, your group is considered a gang or a mob. Um, and so if you think about that, this mall's policy was, you know, didn't allow large groups. It considered large groups of the same sorts of people as a danger or disruption. So um, if you compare that to school, um, that's basically what the social structure is, what it looks like. Yeah, I'm, oh. yeah I was just going to say, um, ask Marlene if she could put on the event page um, the link to where people can learn about the More Blood book. Um, that's bluemanereducation.com slash pages slash more underscore blood um, and also uh, there is a giveaway that you guys can enter for a copy of this book or a $100 Amazon gift card. I would love to win that for sure. I already have a copy of the book and I have read it. Um, more Blood um, was written by Britton LaTulip and it chronicles the history problems and psychology of American schools like you've never heard before with stories from his own life like some of the things that we're hearing right now. So. Uh, Britton, did you have more to say about socialization, or are we ready to move on? Uh, oh, let me cut my mic. Let's see here. You're good. We can hear you. No, you just muted yourself. You were fine. Okay. Now I'm good? You're good. Okay. This is X. Okay. Um, yeah, I did have a ton more to say. You'll, you Go know, ahead. You'll cut me off. <laughs> okay. Um, Go ahead. Like you 150 have <laughs> pages of the book is probably <laughs> talks about the social issue. And age segregation is like a few pages. Um, but I want to point out one more thing. Um, well, really two things. I want to just jump back to socializing in school and how it's a bad model. And one of the key ingredients in, in, in a positive social structure is love. And when you put kids into a school system, um, they're lacking. School is basically void of love. Um, kids may like each other. I'm not saying develop, you know, real friendships can't develop on the outside. But really, school's environment void of love. And so where a kid can feel free to be himself in his home because his, kid, his parents love him no matter what or no matter how he behaves. When he gets into that social structure of school, um, that's not it. Other kids, his peers, they do not love him. And the nature of school, I call it I socializing in the book, but um, it's a silent crowd. There's actually very little socializing that's allowed, that's authorized in the school. It's very short socialization between classes, your passing notes, your, you know, whatever. But for the most part, you're sitting silently in a class looking at other people. And um, so kids are judged on what they wear. That's why it's so important to teens that they're wearing the right brands. Um, and because there is that lack of love, it creates a hierarchy. And um, really, you know, when, when a kid tells you, you know, and she's wearing her fishnet stockings and she looks like a vampire and stuff, you know, gothic or whatever, and she tells you that's who she is, she's really trying to communicate that that is who she is, that if she changes her dress, her friends uh, won't recognize her almost. I mean, who you are is what you look like in the school environment. Um, and you talk about, we talk about the epidemic of bullying. Um, that's largely a byproduct of the school socialization, a place without love. If, if you walk down the street, and let's say there's a bad part of town, and you get beat up, you, you know better. You don't go to that place anymore. You don't associate with those people because they're bad people and they hurt you. In school, you have no choice. You're forced back into that environment every day. And so what happens is, is it develops uh, cliques and, and gangs as a means to protect yourself. So this idea that, that if you put a bunch of diverse people into a small enclosed area, they're all going to learn how to get along. We haven't seen that in schools. What we've seen is, is just the opposite. 
you're forcing these people together that don't necessarily have a lot in common. They don't have a way to really get to know each other, and it um, they, they act very violent towards each other. And we're seeing an epidemic, not just of bullying, but of suicide as the result. Uh, I think the CDC for 2011 has um, 150 sorry, 157,000 attempted suicides. Those are kids who ended up in the ER. They said 16% of kids polled um, had seriously considered suicide, meaning they had come up with a plan and thought about carrying it out. And 4,600 kids, um, and I believe it was 2011, uh, committed suicide. So this is a very serious thing. And so when people criticize the homeschool world because they're lacking socialization, I think it's um. It's very offensive because there are kids literally dying in that social environment. Um, it's very destructive psychologically and physically. I understand if not everybody experiences that, but it is destructive. And I would say it's not just the victims. It's actually the people on top. If you're one of the bullies, I would say you're probably socially um, in a worse place than if you're on the bottom of the barrel because um, because you're, you're really you're, you're being evil, you know? And I'd rather have my kid... Uh, be the victim than the one being the bully. I mean, if you really get down to it. So, anyway, so I just want to bring that up that it is a place without love, and then be more than happy to you know to move to the next topic. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, Mar Marlene, is there anything we need to bring in? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the second myth is that the purpose of school is to educate kids, and I have to say that seems like a no-brainer, right? I mean, school is for education. What else is it for? So this is a pretty, you know, head-scratching myth. It seems so obvious. So tell us why you think, uh, well, or what is the purpose of school according to your book, True Blood, and what you have researched and what you have uncovered in your own experience? Okay, and that goes back to that second part. Um, I said originally that, the, that it's not actually a myth, the socialization aspect of school. Um, it's very much a, a part of school. Um, it's very important to school. It's just not what we think of when we think of socializing. Um, the social environment isn't good for kids. It isn't good for parents. It's absolutely good for the government. Um, and, and I get into that, the power of, of peer pressure um, it's a real power, and it is very powerful. And we're, I know we're kind of running out of time too, but there are tons of studies that reiterate that. Um, one of them would be um, what was saying. Oh, okay. And, and I'm going to give you just an example. This isn't actually a study, but it's a parable, um, and it's a parable meant to illustrate the um, the power of peer pressure and how schools can use that in the classroom. Um, and I would just say this that. The social aspect of, of school is what gives the government and school so much power over children's lives and um, the ability to, I would say, indoctrinate kids, that they couldn't do it outside of that social structure. And it's called the five monkeys experiment is the parable I'm talking about. You've probably heard about it. Um, but this is, while it's a parable, it's based on real research. And it's basically this. There's these behavior psychologists, and they put five monkeys in a cage, and they have a ladder. At the top of the ladder... Um, there's a bunch of bananas, and the first thing the monkeys do is they all run up the, the ladder to get the bananas, but as soon as they do that, the behavior psychologists, they spray them with ice-cold water from a fire hose, okay? And the monkeys try it again, and they get sprayed again, and so they figure out that you can't go up the ladder. So then the behavior psychologists, they remove one of the kids, or sorry, one of the monkeys, and, uh, and they put a new monkey in, and the new monkey doesn't know the rules, so he starts to run up the ladder, and as soon as they do that, they don't only spray him with the hose, they spray all the other monkeys with the hose. Um, and then what happens now is, is any time a monkey goes up the ladder, the other monkeys jump in and, uh, and they attack them. Okay? So now everybody's experienced the hose. Um, so what they do is they remove one of the monkeys, they put another monkey in, and he starts to go up the ladder. And what happens? They don't have to spray the monkey with the hose. The, mon uh, the monkeys attack that monkey. Okay? So they're like, perfect. We've, we've got what we wanted. So they remove one of the other monkeys who knows about the hose, and they put a new monkey in. He starts to go up the ladder, and all the monkeys jump in and attack him. Even the monkey who didn't experience the hose but got attacked by his peers the last time. And eventually they cycle through all the monkeys, and all that's left is monkeys who have never experienced the hose but won't go up the ladder because of the peer socialization. And um, again, I, we're, we're deep, talking about deep, deep, deep topics, and we're just brushing over it really quick. But uh, to give you an idea how schools use that, that everybody is familiar with, um, that is um, oh, group punishment. Um, Basically, where they take a student who's misbehaved and maybe, let's say he, he passed a note in class and, and that was against the rules. 
Uh, nobody in the class cares that he passed a mill. Only the teacher does and, and, and maybe the, the school because it's a rule. Um, and he sure doesn't care. So what they do is, is uh, instead of just disciplining him, they discipline the whole class and they say, you know, no, nobody can go out to, uh, to recess right now. So now all the kids in that class hate the kid, not because he passed a mill, but because he deprived them of recess. And if you really think about that, that is very dangerous. And I don't know what the teacher or school is trying to accomplish by that because t kids don't have any authority to discipline. And so what, what happens is, is they bully him. And maybe they call him bad names. Maybe in between classes they push him or whatever. And then he's made to feel guilty because he didn't just pass a note. He deprived them of, um, of their recess. And so that's just one example of how schools actually use the social structure of school um, to yeah to carry out the education process. Another one is an experiment done by Solomon uh, or sorry um, yeah Solomon Ash, and what he did is he took six students, put them in a in a room, and he had a special experiment set up. And what they did is is they showed three lines of all different lengths, and one of the another line on the side, and they told the uh, the six students to basically find the two lines that were the exact same length, okay? And they were supposed to repeat the line that was the same length, um, but then, and these were the control group, and then, you know, after two or three answers giving the right answer, they were supposed to all in unison give the wrong answer, okay? That was how this, it was set up. Um, so then what they did is they brought a test subject in, he sat down, and they started showing these flashcards, and the test subject, he doesn't understand the experiment, so he's just given the right answer every time. Well, all of a sudden, the test subjects flip on him, and they start giving blatantly wrong answers. So maybe the smallest line on there, they say, is the same size as one of the larger lines. And the test subject knows that they're wrong. It's obvious that they're wrong. Yet the majority of them go along with the crowd very quickly. And the ones that didn't, uh, some of the test subjects would kind of, not the test subject, the control subjects would kind of look over and glare at him. And, uh, and you could see his, his face change, and then the next time around, he'd give the wrong answer. And um, that shows you that in that social group, the social pressure becomes more important um, than the truth. And that's central to what schools are doing. Mm -hmm. um, those, those are some fascinating psychological studies, Britton. Thank you for sharing those with us. It sounds kind of Lord of the Flies-ish. Um, yeah. We have a comment and question Marlene's going to bring in. Okay. Let me... Okay. Go um, ahead. Okay, here we go. So, um, Madeline's asking... Well, she has a comment and then a question. She said, a few years ago, we tried joining a co-op. Um, with a large amount of children present, it reminded me of a large private school. It had the age segregation, and I saw cliques taking place among the students and parents as well. What is, what's your opinion about the environment in co-ops and in comparison to that of a regular school? Um, we have been very careful in our own homeschool environment. Um, to kind of avoid co-ops. I don't think there's anything wrong every once in a while with getting involved with other people, but I'd say the number one problem with homeschoolers is as soon as they escape the, the, the social, or sorry, the, the school, they go home and they try to recreate school, and they even call it homeschooling. They try to recreate school for their kids, and they run into the exact same problems. As you read this book, you'll, you'll discover that schools are legitimate, the social structure is destructive, the curriculums are relevant for the most part, um, there's not a whole lot of redeeming qualities, and then to come home and after rejecting the public school model and recreate that for your kid, you're going to run into the same things. So what we do is, is our kids go hang out with grandma and grandpa, they hang out with their aunts and uncles, they do hang out with other kids, they hang out with the church, but um, we don't actively try to socialize them, especially with kids the exact same age. We do meet with a few families um, at our house just once a week for like an hour for a class and some time together, but we notice that as our kids hang out more and more with their peers, they start to adopt those, again, those destructive social habits and pick up bad habits. So um, I would recommend limiting your time together like that. Thanks, Madeline, for that question. That's a really good point that sometimes private schools, uh, homeschool co-ops, things like that can degenerate because of, as Britton was sharing, some of the 
just the basic social uh, psychological makeup of humans and so those are things we do have to be cautious about uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, the La Tulips have a giveaway going on and this will be going on for a couple of weeks so if you're hearing this even after September 11th uh, go over uh, to the event page and find the link to the raffle copter widget it's on the event page and you can enter to win a copy of um, more blood uh, more blood it was written by Britton La Tulip and it is a journey through public private and elite prep schools and it awakens you to the real educational environment that you might be sending your children to. Uh, Britain wants you to read more blood before you make a choice about how to educate your children. This book is available on bluemannereducation.com as well as on Amazon. You can order it in paperback or digital uh, Kindle edition. So do check out bluemannereducation.com. That's where you can find both Janine and Britton. Uh, they have resources for sale. They have lots of free materials as well. A lot of great content about parenting and educating your children. Um, we are coming to the end of our time, so I want to give Janine and Britton both just a couple of minutes each to kind of give that one little nugget of advice. What one nugget of advice do you want to leave our audience with when it comes to uh, making a choice about public education versus homeschool? Janine, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think one of the key things that I've got out of my school experience is that I really learn nothing of value. I think the three most important things in life is faith, family, and probably finances or um, you know financial independence. And those things are totally neglected in the school system. Um, there's a lot of irrelevant information that your children are being taught. And then also with that, um, you know, just thinking of the relationship between your 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 children and you I I want you to think of coming home and looking in your daughter's eyes and just um, t having her tell you something that she's done that is just totally out of you know out of the air that you wouldn't even think she would be possible doing and that was kind of my story is with my mom I looked into her eyes and I told her that I you know I did this horrible thing. Um, I actually had a, a big party at my house while we were on vacation and she came home and she just looked at me like she had no idea who I was. And this wasn't just some fluke thing. This has been this had been developing, you know, over the years of my of my education. Um, and just that relationship with her was was threatened and was um, you know could have been broken. And when, then when I got out of school, you know, that relationship started healing and I, you know, learned to appreciate my mother and just having to repair that when I'm twenty in my 20s, whereas, you know, without that system, without giving your children up, um, you know, you're guaranteed that relationship, basically. I mean, I think it's um, like 95% of homeschooled children keep their faith and um, versus 70 about 70 percent in the public school so that relationship with your family that bond with your faith all those things are threatened when you give when you hand your responsibility over and that's basically what you're doing um, when you send your children to public school thanks Jenny Britton tell us leave us your closing thoughts what would you tell parents who are trying to make that really difficult decision of how to educate their children okay so I kind of feel like I failed tonight too because I missed like so much stuff because I honestly I didn't realize how fast this was going by. Well, um, Britain, it's just an introduction, and we want everyone to get a copy of More Blood, and they can yeah. read everything you've written. It is a very lengthy book, and so we want them to get a copy. All right. So what I would say, I would leave them with this: the purpose of school really isn't to educate kids. I think that's that's pretty obvious to anybody that st that studies the history of school. Um, Massachusetts, when they passed the 19, uh, 1852 um, compulsory education law, had a had a literacy rate of 99 percent. So it wasn't like they were trying to teach kids to read. Um, right now, it's I think it's dropped to like 90 percent. Um, if you read this book, and and I I struggle to even tell you that what you really should do. Um, because because you can't get there without reading the book. But I would say this: me personally, after doing research on the school system and always dreaming that my kid would go to an elite prep school, and now I'm homeschooling. I would say this: 
Um, I would live under a bridge with my family before I'd put my kids in school. And I know that sounds outrageous and that sounds offensive. Um, and I'm not trying to criticize teacher. I think teachers are victims in this as well. I think they need to read the book to see what's really going on. We've had a lot of negative feedback from teachers who then came back and were like, yeah, I get it. Now what can I do? And I think that they should work within the system to try to impact kids' lives. But if you're a parent and you have a kid in the school system, um, understand you have you do have to get them out. You're, you're not in a war of uh, of information. So you think that, okay, they're going to go to school and they're going to learn about evolution and I'm going to teach them about um, creationism and we're in a battle over um, the intellect or the brain. Okay, we're, we're in a battle over habits. When you start digging into educational psychology, um, you're, you're looking at a science that conditions habits. Like, a, like for instance, I, I, I give the example of biting my nails. I've been biting my nails since I was five years old. I can't give it up. I do it subconsciously. I don't even think about it, and I just start chewing on my nails. Um, there are habits and patterns of behavior put into the school system to condition behavior in your children. And your, your kids can be, you know, they can believe in God, they can believe in all the right things, but they will create habits, destructive habits in school that they will not be able to get up when they give up when they're removed from that system. Um, so, uh, gosh, there's just so much more to say, but that's really what I would... Thanks, Britton. That's a that's a very important warning that you're giving to our audience, and we we can sense your passion, and we thank you, and Janine, both mm -hmm. of you, for spending these these minutes with us, and for our audience, uh, we thank you for joining us. Uh, remember, you can find us every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you'll go to ihomeschoolnetwork.com/hangouts, you can see our entire schedule. Uh, for 2014. We ask that you circle us on Google Plus, iHomeschool Network, subscribe to our YouTube channel, iHomeschool Network, and subscribe to our podcast on Stitcher and iTunes. It's called iHomeschool Podcast. We keep everything really simple. I want to give a shout out to Marlene Griffiths, my lovely production manager and right-hand woman. And once again, we appreciate our audience. If you have other questions or comments, please leave them on the event page and Britton and Janine I'm sure would be happy to follow up and dialogue with you please enter that giveaway for a free copy of more blood and check them out at bluemanereducation.com good night everyone